Born in Comiso, Sicily in 1915, Salvatore Fiume was a painter, a sculptor, an architect, a writer and a stage designer. These two photos show Fiume's father, a carpenter, and his mother, an embroiderer, and Salvatore at the age of eight with his father. When he was eight, Fiume started devoting himself to drawing with great passion and dedication, soon acquiring a remarkable technique. At age 16, in 1931, Fiume won a scholarship to the Royal Institute for the Book Illustration in Urbino, northern Italy. This is the Palace of the Dukes of Urbino, which hosted and still hosts the school and a very important museum. There, Fiume learned the main printing techniques. At the end of the five-year courses, he was chosen by the school to illustrate The Rape of the Pale by Tassoni, published by the school press in 1941. In Urbino, Fiume met the great Italian Renaissance painting which would influence him for the rest of his life. Here we see the flagellation by Piero della Francesca and an image from the profanation of the host by Paolo Cello. This is a photo of Fiume at age 19. On the right, he is seated with schoolmates in Urbino. There, he met Ines Gualazzi. This is her first portrait who became his wife in 1940 and gave him two children, Luciano and Laura. In 1936, Fiume went to Milan in hopes to start a career as a painter. There he met important intellectuals like writer Dino Buzzati and poet Salvatore Quasimodo, who was to receive the Nobel Prize in 1959. A few months later, Fiume was called to the military service and at the end of the training courses he was a lieutenant of the infantry. In 1938 he was hired by Mr. Adriano Olivetti as art director of the Olivetti Company magazine. In 1942 Fiume was recalled to the army in Biela, Piedmont, where his battalion was about to leave for the Russian campaign. One day, Fiume was sent for by Colonel Giorgio Lachelli, who had a passion for drawing. Colonel asked Fiume to draw his portrait. Astonished by the extraordinary ability shown by Fiume in making his portrait in a few minutes, the Colonel decided that such a talent should not risk being lost in war, and with a pretext, had him admitted to the hospital of Novara, where Fiume wrote his first novel. Viva Gioconda, and carried out a painting on a plaster bas-relief in the office of the hospital chief officer, Colonel Vercelli. Soon after the war, in 1946, having decided to dedicate himself entirely to art, Fiume left Olivetti and moved to Canso near Como, northern Italy, where he settled in a 19th century former silk mill a huge building which became his studio. In those spaces, Fiume carried out large paintings and a few big sculptures. In 1953, a section of the building became his permanent home. From Canso, he often traveled to Milan, where he met the poet Raffaele Carrieri, also a very influential art critic, who was enthused by Fiume's drawings. Carrieri was joined to see the drawings by his friend Alberto Savinio, a very prestigious painter and writer, and they were happy to agree that a new talent was discovered. In the new paintings that Fiume was producing at that time, one can clearly recognize both the influence of the Italian Renaissance painting and that of metaphysical works by Italian masters like Giorgio de Chirico his brother Alberto Savinio, and Carlo Carrà. This was the kind of painting he believed in. Here are a few of his works from that time. 
But in those years, art dealers in Milan thought there was no market for that kind of painting. Clearly, Fiume's cities of statues contained elements of novelty, not only in painting, but also in relation to his idea of a sculptural architecture that was not so easy to appreciate at first sight. This island of statues of 1948, now at the MoMA of New York, is one of the first examples of that idea, an architecture whose buildings are conceived as huge sculptures, geometrically anthropomorphic or zoomorphic. Determined to establish himself in the art world, Fiume decided to resort to an original stratagem. He invented the existence of a Spanish Gitano painter, he called him Francisco Cuello, and painted a group of works inspired by the Spanish tradition and folklore. Thanks to his extraordinary technical ability, he carried out a number of works potentially easier to understand, and signed them Francisco Cuello. Then he showed a few of them to the Gussoni Gallery manager of Milan, telling the totally invented story of the painter Francisco Cuello. He said he was a friend of his, hiding in Paris to elude the Franco regime, who had asked Fiume to arrange an exhibition in Italy for him. The paintings were very well received, and the exhibition was held, turning out a great success. This was in 1948. All the paintings signed Cuello were sold very quickly, and an important art critic of the time wrote that Francisco Cuello was a Spanish master from whom many Italian painters could have something to learn. And this was the adventurous beginning of Fiume's career as a painter. Fiume's first exhibition under his own name was at the Borromini Gallery of Milan in 1949. This portrait of his wife, Ines, and the following triptych are from that exhibition. In them, the influences of both the Italian Quattrocento and of the metaphysical painting are very clear. In this photo, we see Fiume, Raffaele Carrieri, Alberto Savigno, painter Felicita Fry, with the family of gallery owner Guido Lenoci during the Milan exhibition. Enthused by the paintings at the Borromini Gallery, Mr. Buitoni, president of Perugina Chocolate Factory, asked Fiume to carry out a cycle of ten paintings on the history of the Umbria region. Inspired by the Italian painting of the 15th century, Fiume completed his task in 1952. In 1988, the entire cycle was donated by the Buitoni family to the Umbria region, and it is now kept at its headquarters of Palazzo Donini in Perugia. In 1950, Fiume was invited to the Biennale of Venice, where he presented this triptych, which is now in the modern art collection of the Vatican Museums. During the Biennale of Venice, Life magazine dedicated a whole page to one of Fiume's paintings, and commissioned him three paintings for its headquarters in New York. In them, he created an imaginary reconstruction of Manhattan, whose old skyscrapers resembled the gigantic anthropomorphic architectures of his island of statues. At the Biennale, the distinguished Italian architect Gio Ponti, with Fiume in this photo, was so enthusiastic about Fiume's triptych that he decided to commission him the large painting, Mythical Italy, for the main lounge of the Giulio Cesare transatlantic liner. 
In 1952, Fiume was commissioned by Gioponti an even larger painting, 48 meters by 3 meters, for the main lounge of the Andrea Doria liner, entitled The Legends of Italy. The painting was meant to offer a preview of masterpieces that travelers would admire in some of the most beautiful Italian cities. The visual impact of the huge painting was such that some said that the ship had been built around the painting. These images from the June 1953 issue of Life magazine show, among other famous artworks, Michelangelo's Moses and Leonardo's Mona Lisa. This is Raphael's Marriage of the Virgin, which you can recognize on the right side of this photo from Life magazine. Notice the technical difficulty of reproducing a foreshortened view of Raphael's painting while keeping into account both the perspective of the whole scene and the perspective within Raphael's painting. Here Fiume is with the young painters Gianfranco Ferroni and Angelo D'Averio, hired by him to help cover large sections of the painting in the pure tradition of the Italian Renaissance artists' shops or botteghe. In this photo, we see them with Fiume pretending to be hanging Raphael's portrait of Pope Julius II. Here, Ferroni pretends to be holding up Titian's portrait of poet Ariosto by Fiume. This is Admiral Andrea Doria's statue by sculptor Giovanni Paganin with decorative elements by Fiume on its armor. This is the rough-molded clay version of the sculpture, placed in the same position it was to occupy on the ship. Paganin and Fiume photographed next to the final clay version before it was cast in bronze. After the sinking of the Andrea Doria off the island of Nantucket in 1956, the statue was recovered in two stages. In 1964, it was brought to surface without its base. Then, in 1996, diver John Moyer of Boston recovered the base of the statue in hopes to be able to join it back to the rest of the statue. Introduced by Alberto Savinio, Fiume began to collaborate with the Scala Theatre of Milan by designing the sets and costumes for Manuel de Faglia's The Short Life in 1952. In the same year, he also drew the sketches for Beethoven's ballet The Creatures of Prometheus. In this photo, we see Fiume at the Scala Theatre with his wife Ines. and in the next one with Gio Ponti, his wife Giulia, their older daughter Lisa, Ines Fiume and Lisa's husband. Here Fiume is photographed while suggesting a movement to a few dancers. And here are two sketches for Cherubini's Medea and Maria Callas, who in this image and in the following one is wearing two different costumes designed by Fiume, who preferred to decorate costumes by painting on them, as from a distance, embroidery and stitches are almost invisible. In this picture, one can recognize American conductor Leonard Bernstein, surrounded by extras during a Medea rehearsal, with Maria Callas and Austrian stage director Margarita Wallmann. While Medea was being produced, Giorgio De Chirico often went to see Fiume during lighting tests. Here we see them together at the premiere. This photo shows Fiume on the Scala stage in a set of Bellini's Norma. Here we see a sketch for The Flame by Italian musician Ottorino Respighi and below, the stage during performance. Here are two sketches for Verdi's Nabucco, 
And these are two sketches for Rossini's Wilhelm Tell. Here, Fiume is standing by the backdrop of a ballet on the music of Ravel's Bolero at the Scala in 1967. Fiume alla Scala is the title of the exhibition held at the Scala Theatre Museum in 2015 for the centenary of Fiume's birth. In this image, on the right, we see Maria Callas' costume in Medea in the same exhibition. Fiume's self-portrait, donated to the Scala Museum by his children, can be seen on top left. For the Covent Garden of London, Fiume did the sets and costumes of Verdi's Aida in 1957. Here, he is photographed through a model of the stage, which, in the next image, appears in full size during performance. Through this oil painting of 1960 called The Stage, Fiume paid homage to the opera theater, imagining a stage overcrowded with characters. Soprano Maria Callas, in a light blue costume, can be recognized on the right side of the painting. The circled portraits are those of Fiume's son Luciano, left, Fiume's wife Ines and her three sisters, center. Next to them is Fiume wearing an armor, and to the right is daughter Laura. The painting is on permanent display at Palazzo Lombardia in Milan. Fiume became involved with ceramics because of the existence of an old kiln in the Canso former silk mill. He invited four ceramists to reactivate the kiln and set up a full-size laboratory for him. There, he created a series of ceramic works, some of which are seen on display in the Villa Olmo Gardens of Como which were greatly appreciated by architect Gio Ponti, who introduced a number of them in several homes in Milan, while publishing their photos in Domus magazine. In these works of the 1950s, it is clear how the use of terracotta was particularly suitable to images consistent with the archaic flavor of the islands of statues. Here we see a few of them at the 2012 exhibition at Palazzo Pirelli of Milan. When the other ceramists left Canso, Emilio Romani settled there as an assistant of Fiume for the rest of his life. From London, Fiume traveled to Spain to see the masterpieces in the Prado Museum of Madrid, especially the works of the two major Spanish painters Velázquez and Goya, as he wanted to make a few copies of their paintings. At the Prado, he copied a few of them. This is Charles IV's portrait from Goya. And when he returned to Italy, he completed a whole cycle of works inspired by those two Spanish masters. In some of them, he introduced historical characters of Goya's time, like members of the royal family, the Duchess of Alba, or Goya himself, portrayed in his own studio next to some of his famous works. This painting of 1966, now at the Museo del Novecento of Milan, belongs to that cycle. The idea of the cycle of the beat paintings came to Fiume when he saw the deep change in the Londoner's clothing and attitudes, mainly in the youth, between his first visit to London in 1957 and the second one during the mid-60s. His painting was strongly influenced by those changes, revealing an entirely new freedom of expression 
if compared to the exactness of his works of the 1940s and 50s. As can be seen, for example, in this collage. This fresh attitude also brought Fiume to cast his ironical look on the customs of the artists of that time. Here are some of those met by him during his journeys to several European cities in the late 1960s and early 70s. In 1968, Fiume held an exhibition at the Cortina Gallery of Milan, entirely dedicated to this theme. Since 1957, when Fiume came back from his trip to London, a delicate element of sensuality appeared in his painting. An element which would accompany most of his successive work. These paintings belong to Fiume's production, where the female figure is often at the core of his pictorial research. During the 1960s, Fiume traveled to various countries, and on his return, he had ideas about new pictorial themes. In Somalia, he was fascinated by the Somali women walking in the wind. In the Oriental markets, he was intrigued by the local customs, which inspired him stories of vendors and beautiful purchasers. The cycle of the Mexicans was inspired by his journey to Mexico and by watching his favorite films by Sergio Leone. In 1971, Fiume traveled to the island of Bali, where he was struck by the beauty of the women and by the naive paintings of local artists. From that journey, Fiume was inspired for a series of works that he carried out by painting on canvases decorated by Balinese painters, which he had previously purchased from them. He did that not out of disrespect for those artists, but rather to pay tribute to their art and to the Balinese beauties by incorporating it within his own art. The Polynesian cycle is the result of Hume's last journey to a far country. In 1992, he traveled to Tahiti, attracted by the places that had inspired most works by Paul Gauguin. Though remaining essentially figurative, Fiume wanted to express himself also through more geometrical forms. And so he did by carrying out a number of paintings about wrestling dragons, models and even religious subjects. In 1973, Fiume traveled to the Babile Valley in Ethiopia as he wanted to paint his islands of statues on a group of rocks. He was accompanied by his friend photographer Walter Mori of Epoca magazine, who documented all the stages of the event. Using marine paint in 12 days of intense work and in an extremely hot and dry weather, Fiume was able to accomplish his purpose. In 1974, he held a large retrospective at the Palazzo Reale of Milan, where he exhibited a partial polystyrene reconstruction of the Ethiopian rocks in the huge Sala delle Cariatidi. He also exhibited several paintings inspired by the beauty of female figures he had met in Africa, among them the African Mona Lisa, now in the Vatican Museums a tribute to the women of that continent inspired by Leonardo's Mona Lisa. Here Fiume is at the Alhambra of Granada, Spain, with Zeuditu Negash, the young woman he met during one of his journeys to Ethiopia, who became his companion for the last 20 years of his life, after Fiume's wife's death in 1976. 
Back from his rock painting experience of 1973, Fiume felt the need to paint on a rocky material similar to the one he had liked so much in Ethiopia. So he had a few rocks from the Lambro River cut in halves and painted his islands of statues on them. He then continued on a similar experience with his graffiti by painting on surfaces resembling the rocks decorated thousands of years ago by anonymous artists of the caves of Altamira in Spain and Lascaux in France, by which he had been so deeply impressed. As mentioned earlier, Fiume was also a writer, and in later life also a poet. These are the covers of the books written by him, novels, plays, short stories, poems and reflections on art and life that won him an honoris causa degree in modern literature from the University of Palermo in 1988. Drawing had a fundamental role in Fiume's artistic life. In one of his writings he stated, the interpretation of drawings is among the most fascinating ways of analyzing art and the human mind. In fact, in a drawing, faults, strengths, weaknesses of its author can be revealed better than in a written confession. In the arts, it is the main protagonist, at times visible, at times invisible. In many artworks, it stirs everything without revealing itself, and by itself it can represent all arts. Fiume illustrated many literary works, here are a few examples. These are images from the novel Bernadette by Franz Werfel. These are from the Scarlet Letter by Nathaniel Hawthorne. And these for the novel Quo Vadis by the Polish writer Sienkiewicz. These tables show Fiume's ability in drawing whole crowds within the space of a tablet of the size of 10 by 17 centimeters. On a background of uniform brown color, Fiume would use a flexible razor blade to remove thinner or thicker layers of color in order to be able to outline massive bodies as well as transparencies. Fiume had a highly personal vision of architecture, which he expressed through various drawings, plastic models, and in many of his paintings known as Cities of Statues and islands of statues. The central idea is that of an anthropomorphic and zoomorphic architecture whose buildings are conceived as huge, inhabitable sculptures. This is a plastic model from the late 1970s for a building on the island of Favignana, Sicily. Unfortunately, the project encountered several obstacles that prevented its realization. For this project of a church, Fiume was inspired by the figure of Jesus Christ. In 1977, it was presented to Pope Paul VI by his private secretary, who then reported that His Holiness was deeply impressed by it. Here are some drawings of zoomorphic buildings. The first one, shaped like a cock, was meant to be located in Polynesia. The second, inspired by an African mask, is shaped like the head of a wolf, while the third one was meant for a shell-shaped home on the seashore. More suitable for construction, as can be seen in these drawings, are both this project for a cock-shaped building and this other one in the shape of a bull. This plastic model of a spherical theatre from the early 1950s was particularly appreciated by the distinguished architect Gio Ponti. The following projects, which belong to the last stage of his production, were conceived in the 1980s for cities of the Middle East. One of them has the shape of a crown, the other one that of a half moon. This flagellation 
and the sketch for a painting on the life of St. Francis show how the religious theme could not be lacking in the production of an artist trained in the great tradition of Italian painting. This crucifixion was painted by Fiume in 1975 for the collection of Pope Paul VI, to which in 1977 Fiume added the donation of 34 works, here we see a selection of them, to which the Vatican Museums dedicated an exhibition in December 2015 for the centenary of Fiume's birth. This deposition has been at the Hermitage Museum in St. Petersburg since 1991, when Fiume held a large exhibition in Moscow. Finally, this is the sketch for the large mosaic in the Annunciation Basilica of Nazareth in the Holy Land. As with painting, also with sculpture, Fiume was inspired by old masters like Donatello, Michelangelo and Bernini, and by modern ones like Rodin, Arturo Martini, Marino Marini and Giovanni Paganin. These four paintings, representing four owls, are meant to introduce us, through the language of painting, to the section dedicated to Fiume's sculptures, like the cock, exhibited first at the Triennale of Milan and then at Palazzo Lombardia, and the warrior in Salvatore Fiume's home. These two sculptures of African inspiration are made of wood and the sculpture called Lichiska is a bronze. The structural element used by Fiume for his large sculptures was polyurethane foam which is easily modeled with a blade. In this image we see some sculptures on display at the Galleria L'Isola of Milan. Fiume also used fiberglass as for the sculpture The Three Graces, later cast in bronze and placed in Piazza Piemonte in Milan. The Anthropotorus and his woman is another fiberglass sculpture by Fiume. Here, his assistant Alessandro Pina is helping him finish the sculpture whose bronze version is in the courthouse square of Varese. Through these images, one can realize how in Fiume's work there is a thematic coherence between painting, sculpture and drawing. In the early 1990s, Fiume conceived the idea of juxtaposing a number of sculptures made by himself in an apparently casual manner thus obtaining the effect of making to appear fortuitous what had actually been deliberately designed. Then, in his museum reconstructions, Fiume created a number of fragments of a hypothetical old sculptures and presented them the way in which they are displayed in museums, with all the charm of their incompleteness. These two were exhibited at the Auditorium Parco della Musica in Rome in 2008. These are images of Fiume's sculptures in public spaces. The wine fountain in Marsala, Sicily. Here we see Fiume at Canso with the rough-hued sculpture. This is another version of the Three Graces at the Park Museum of Portofino. This is the bronze statue at the European Parliament in Strasbourg, France. In 2012, Fiume's children, Laura and Luciano, donated 13 works representing most of Fiume's themes, to the Lombardy region, which hosts them in the Spazio Fiume. This is the entrance to Palazzo Lombardia in Milan. The cycle Pictorial Alliances is made of paintings carried out by Fiume with eight young artists, 
including his daughter Laura, also a painter, and his student. Between 1973 and 1994, the following painters often visited his studio. Franz Borghese, Paola Grott, Gianni Matteo, Angelo Mainardi Araldi, Enzo Patti, Ercole Pignatelli, and Daniela Romano. In order to carry out this cycle, Fiume designed for each artist the painting or the paintings he had in mind, taking into account style, themes, and ability of each of them. Thus, these artworks are the pictorial translations of ideas by Fiume carried out for four hands in collaboration with a number of talented artists over a period of many years. In 1975, the little town of Fiumefreddo in Calabria welcomed enthusiastically Fiume's proposal of revitalizing its historic town center with some of his works. So, starting in the same year, Fiume painted the internal and some external walls of the old crumbling castle, where he depicted, not without a touch of irony, scenes of old Saracen invasions. These are the pages in Epoca magazine on the paintings of the castle. Unfortunately, with the passing of time, the frescoes were almost entirely destroyed by weather. These pictures show the paintings in their original condition. And these are the frescoes painted by Fiume in 1996. This fresco, still well preserved, is in the San Rocco chapel. Here, the miracles of the saint are represented in a circular motion. On the difficulties of this work, Fiume wrote, A painter of our time who ventures into an experience like that of Fiume Freddo does not know the difficulties of painting on a concave surface which might be described as rotating because of the innumerable foreshortenings created by every change of the point of view. Later, Fiume donated to the little town of Fiumefredo two bronze sculptures for its two squares. This cycle of paintings of 1989, called by Fiume Japanese poems, were inspired by the erotic iconography of most works of the Japanese figurative art. This cycle concluded many years of his relationship with the Japanese culture since Fiume's first journey to Tokyo and Kyoto in 1967, where he was strongly impressed by the intensity and perfection of the No Theatre and the Kabuki Theatre. One of his first paintings inspired by the Japanese theatre is this character of the Kabuki Theatre of 1969, now in the Vatican Museums. In these paintings forming the cycle of the hypothesis, which concludes this presentation, figures from works by modern artists like, for example, Manet, Picasso and De Chirico, coexist and interact with pictorial elements by older masters like Botticelli, Tintoretto, Raphael, Rembrandt, Rubens, Goya and Velázquez. On the background of typical images of Fiume's works like his islands of statues, or next to his female figures, here is what Fiume wrote about his hypothesis. I have painted the hypothesis of the contemporariness of works from different periods and artists by introducing in them images often recurring in my own paintings. As if even for them the time had come to be hypothesized without a date and projected into time. I think I can say that the great artworks must have been generated by great hypotheses. Hypothesis in form, hypothesis in style, in architecture and stage design. To have it confirmed, one should simply observe the works by Paolo Cello and Piero della Francesca. Otherwise, it would be impossible to explain the metaphysical compositions by Giorgio De Chirico and Carlo Carrà, or the visionary works created within the Futurism. Every work of art is the materialization of a hypothesis. 
The cycle of the hypothesis is the culmination of a conceptual journey begun in 1952 with Fiume's paintings for the Andrea Doria liner, a journey that continued with the works inspired by Goy and Velázquez and with the cycle of the pictorial alliances. The unifying element of these four cycles, as far away in time and space as they are, is the presence in each of them of elements from works of other artists. Therefore, it can be said that the hypotheses form a summer of the European art of the past five centuries, where Fiume makes several masterpieces of art history coexist with elements of his own painting. Implicitly proposing himself as the last heir in the 20th century of that great tradition.